And, you know, he tried over and over. Jacob was there. Jacob left. Jacob had to go back. I mean, you can just follow the pattern all the way through the Word of God. Many times he had a group in the promised land that could not bring forth what he wanted at a certain time. And they get out of Egypt, and first time they get in the promised land, they back away from the promise. They slander the promise. That will not happen here in Scranton. They said, gosh, everything the Lord said about this is here. All, all the, uh, the grapes, the milk, the honey, the land, all the houses, everything that's been prepared for us. But we saw a giant standing overlooking it, and we're out of here. See, in your promise is the factor of war. Always, that has always been factored in. And somebody to establish the promise has to face off what has already been given them to triumph over. And I'm going to say that again. Your enemies are already inside your ultimate promise. But somebody, look at somebody next to you and say, somebody, somebody has to face. Somebody has to face off the ites that are working, been working for you for the last 10 generations. Now, that is the warfare pro promise that you need. See, war is the grace to fight. And we don't look at war like that. That's one of the meanings in Hebrew of the word war. It is the grace to fight. You've already been given this land. It's just that somebody is going to have to face off what's resisting a manifestation of heaven's glory in the land. And I go back to what the Lord said in the dream about Scranton, Pennsylvania. He said, until they gather in Scranton, America cannot have revival. See, so you've got something about God speaking that has to be interpreted by man. That's the way revelation works. And I had to say, okay, they have now gathered in Scranton. I said this last night to the Lord. They have now gathered in Scranton. Something has come alive. Now, now, what you have to determine from that word, until they gather in Scranton, America can't see revival. Did they gather in Scranton so all of America can come into a new place? See? Will the effects of this gathering be the model for all of America where people who have cried out over and over for the Spirit of God to come now, will this be the model that creates that movement from town to town, city to city, all through America? And you look at the promises over Rochester, how will those promises manifest so that Rochester and its call to America will proceed? See, this is the only way we're going to see America as a whole change. Will the call to our first people come in and be healed strongly enough that the fivefold in the first people will now rise up and lead in a way they were meant to lead in the beginning. And I think I've spent as much effort in that as anyone 
My mother and my grandmother was Chickasaw. I, I knew I was taught. My brother and sister were not taught the ways of the first people. But the first child was always given to the maternal one to help teach them to pass on the ways of the people. And because of that, I have things in me that I had to release. My mother didn't understand it till weeks before she died. And yet, there's something you're carrying in you today that you uniquely are responsible to release, to create a movement in days ahead, to accelerate the movement in days ahead. My brother shares one story that was quite a traumatic story, but it was awesome. He was quite a traumatic person, uh, and he still is. Uh, but I would go, we raced horses, so we would go to the horse races, and I had an ability. And some of those old guys knew I had an ability to pick winners. <laughs> some of us ride, and some of us pick, you know. <laughs> And so I would lay under, because, you know, I wasn't old enough to be doing all that. I would lay under this vehicle, and they would bring me their sheets. <laughs> and one horse that was racing that my dad knew was supposed to win, the jockey got hurt in a previous race. So I was more plump than a normal jockey, if you get my drift. <laughs> and was smarter than most of the jockeys. And I had my role. But my brother, who was always a piece of work, <laughs> my dad just took him and put him up on the racehorse because he was the right size and said, you'll ride this, and I won't use his language, but you will ride this horse. <laughs> now, the only thing he had ever ridden was one of those broken down horses that you learn to ride on. Well, he panicked. And yet, he knew he had to ride. He never grabbed hold of the mane. My dad uh, never grabbed hold of the reins. He grabbed hold of the mane. And he had to hang on for dear life. <laughs> but that horse, which was a blessing for both of us, won the race. My picks and him riding kept us moving forward. <laughs> Cheryl, you might not even be able to touch the reins. Now, that's my word. And it's, it's very difficult. That situation was very difficult. And he cried and cried and went on and on and on and last year he's over one of the larger title companies in our area last year the these two couples from east texas came to him and to do a closing they had bought a big piece of land in east texas and the guy looked at him and said are you one of those pierces because he said, I, I, I was from East Texas growing up. He said, are you one of those pierces? And he said, yes. He said, I was a, a young, young fella 
when they put you on that horse. And Keith said, I thought everybody thought, well, that kid is the biggest pansy on earth. He said, we all thought you, now this is years and years later. He said, we all thought you were the greatest hero that was in the whole place. See? So, see, what you're going to have to do is see your role in the movement and see how to process where you go from here. Do you, are you called to see everything come forth in Scranton? Or from Scranton, are you called to see a nation advance? See, that becomes the real question now. 